Yeah. Okay. It is seven of six. And on that note, I think I'm going to transition and introduce you all and then we can get going into to all of this and more. Um, so everyone who is in the audience, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for joining us. My name is Rachel Asip and I'm the managing editor at N plus one. And I'm really excited to welcome everyone to tonight's event, uh, the Chinese diaspora and the future of literary studies with Nan Da, Elena Young and Jane Hu. Um, the event is convened around the publication of Nan's essay, Disambiguation, a Tragedy, which appeared in the most recent issue of N plus one, Death Wish. As you may or may not know, being in the audience, um, N plus one is a small nonprofit magazine and publisher and we really rely on your generosity to do the work that we do to keep events like these frequent and free. Um, so if you don't already subscribe to N plus one, it's a great way to keep reading and supporting more work like this. And you can follow the link to subscribe that will be in the chat. Um, if you already subscribe, um, but you have a little more to give or your circumstances might be whatever they are if you don't subscribe but want to contribute a little bit um, we ask that you consider donating five dollars for the event um, we make sure all of our events are free because we want them to be accessible to everyone and anyone um, but that support will help us do more of them continue them and help us to publish great authors like none so the donate link will also be in the chat and we'd be really grateful for anything you can give Okay, now on to the good stuff. Um, Nanda is an assistant professor in the Department of English, Language and Literature at the University of Notre Dame and concurrent faculty in the Department of East, Anguage, East Asian Languages and Cultures. Uh, she specializes in American and Chinese literature and literary histories and comparative literature and social theory. She is the author of Intransitive Encounter, Sino-US Literatures and the Limit Limits of Exchange, published by Columbia University Press in 2018, and the author of articles published in Critical Inquiry, New Literary History, American Literary History, Signs, and public venues such as the Yale Review and the Los Angeles Review of Books. She's currently work working on a book-length version of um, the argument presented in Disambiguation a Tragedy, which is her essay for us. Elena Young is an associate professor of English at the University of Minnesota, where it is very cold. She is the author of When Fiction Feels Real, Representation and the Reading Mind, published by Oxford in 2018, and more recently, articles on what we mean by reading and the unspoken intimacy of aesthetic experience. Jane Hu is a PhD candidate in English and Film and Media at UC Berkeley. Her writing has appeared in venues like Textual Practice, Modernism, Modernity, Victorian Studies, The New Yorker, The New York Times, and Book Forum, among others. We're just so excited and grateful to have all three of you here tonight. Uh, Disambiguation, a Tragedy is an essay on the art and importance of subtle distinction making and the pain that occurs when opportunities for such distinction making are foreclosed. Um, disambiguation becomes tragic non rights when it is rendered useless or it leads to outcomes that are inhumane. Her essay adroitly weaves threads between political and personal tragedies of the cultural revolution and its present echoes, gaslighting as a broad and complicating tactic, and the importance of literature and literary cr criticism as spaces to practice and hone our abilities to understand and interpret what has actually happened in a given situation. To begin, Nan will read a sh short excerpt from the essay itself. And then she'll be joined in conversation by Elaine and Jane. There'll be a short Q&A toward the end. So please think about questions throughout and put them in the Q&A. Um, once again, we're so thrilled to have you all here. And I'm going to turn it over to Nan. Thank you, Rachel. Um, it's an honor to, um, to, have this, to be able to have this event. I'm really grateful to you, Rachel and, and Mark, uh, and Mark Roth and, and uh, Sarah for the editorial work you did for this piece and for taking this kind of wonky piece, um, which I had been writing, uh, I'd spent a while thinking about what my attitude is to the relationship between something like microaggression or micro injustice and something like critical sensibility with the conditions that need to be in place for interpreting a work of literature as best you can. Um, and the more I thought about it, the sort of more con 
confused I became. Um, whether, you know, questions like uh, whether micro injustice belongs in the realm of literary criticism, um, whether poetic justice is, uh, which, right, by, by Thomas Reimer's 1678 definition is that which can sort of keep tabs, uh, 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 things, you know, that which keeps tabs on things that no one can see or would care to track, and then renders judgments by rules that no real court of law you know, could or should, should admit, right? I was having this sort of complicated relationship to poetic justice, whether it would be sufficient or not. Um, and I was really lucky to be able to publish in um, an imprint, you know, that treats, that has a history of treating this topic, um, micro injustice or difficult truth telling that requires extraordinary amounts of nuance. Um, that, that treats that as a kind of actual object of analysis, right? Something actually difficult to comprehend, something with upper and lower bounds, um, something that's, that's always ensnared with stereotype. Uh, so, you know, the most recent essay that I'm thinking of is Andrew Longchu's Bad TV, which explains how victims of sexual abuse are gaslit, right? By the way that their testimonies sound, which is often like soap operas. You know, so that scenes of sexual harm often look like melodrama, and so then when they are repeated as melodrama, as melodrama, sorry, they become kind of oddly unreliable. Um, so I, you know, this is a long way of saying that I'm happy to, I feel lucky to be part of this conversation um, as taking place inside this journal. With this particular essay, I wanted also to test what the essay form is capable of, right? As a, um, uh, a long form that can communicate a completely private joy or despair. Um, you know, so it's a personal, it's oddly enough, a personal essay. There are also other essay forms that are in here, um, one of which is actually the Chinese essay. Um, you know, the, the, the civil service examination essay, the historical civil service examination essay, or even like, you know, the, the Zhou right, which is a missive delivered to the sovereign that's for his eyes only. Right? And these two genres of Chinese essays often use acts of reading comprehension or literary interpretation or commentary, right, as a form of like literary um, analysis, um, illusionism to try to rectify a situation without angering the sovereign. Um, and so, that, so this essay, I think, tries to do a little bit of that too. It's an older form of literary critical intervention, a kind of rhetorical puzzle for, for parhesia, right? For speaking truth to power in a way that's designed to get past um, layers of obstacles. So I will, I guess, read it now. Um, I'll just read from the beginning. There's so much going on in this essay, uh, and I'm sure to many that might, that will um, seem like a flaw. I was trying to, well, the essay works like a proof, and so I felt like I had to get everything in place. Um, I also felt like I had to show you all of these things just to explain or clarify something about the works of, um, of uh, Ewing Lee. So I'll just start at the beginning since um, there's so much content everywhere. Um, and I'll uh, excerpt a little from further in this as well. Okay. So in her memoir, uh, Dear Friend from My Life, I Write to You in Your Life, the contemporary Chinese American writer Ewing Lee recounts something that Marian Moore's mother had done, which recalled something that Lee's own mother had done. The young Marion Moore had become attached to a kitten that she named Buffy, short for Buffalo. One day her mother drowns the creature, an act of cruelty that Marion Moore inexplicably defends. And this is what Lee has to say in her memoir. The menacing logic by which Moore's mother functioned is familiar. When my sister started working after college, she gave me a pair of hamsters as a present I became fond of them and soon after they disappeared. I gave them away, my mother said. 
Look how obsessed you are with them. You can't even show the same devotion to your parents. Having something that you love snatched away because you love it is maddening because there's no way to gainsay it. You can only protest on the grounds that indeed you experience the attachment of which you are accused. This leaves the child Lee in a position roughly analogous to anyone who having been punctured bristles at the accusation of being thin-skinned, protesting would have been uh, to play into her mother's hands and to prove her right. Elsewhere in Dear Friend, Lee recounts the private drama of her daily journey home as a schoolgirl in China. The, the trip is both boring and treacherous. After a classmate is molested and disappears, Lee is asked by her mother, quote, with omniscient suspicion of any man on the bus had touched her inappropriately. Lee internally deflects this violating question with irony. How could she not understand that I was made invisible by having been old already, too old for those men lurking in the dark? To apply the logic of the hamster tail, Lee effectively tells us that her mother's torments are so extreme that they had aged her out of attractiveness, even though she was still a child. She was too old to receive unwanted attention. But how could she complain about this? What, would she have actually wanted to look sexy and appealing to predators? So her self-imposed silence, as Lee calls it, was the only possible response. The logical conundrum forced on the child Lee by her mother's question is the ultimate form of gaslighting. While her mother is not exactly sowing doubt in Lee's mind about her own reality, um, she makes it pointless for her to register how it really was. But even now, among her contemporary readers, the circumstances for her victimization can be difficult to discern. The felt pointlessness of subtle disambiguation names a problem foundational to literary studies, the diminishing returns of distinction making. By distinction, I don't mean what we're due identified as those ever finer, ever more abstracted ways of signaling one's status. I'm referring instead to the bias correcting mechanisms that mid-century literary critics saw activated when, when readers acknowledge the difficulty of basic comprehension, of mapping out what has actually happened in a piece of literature and what confusion an author has deliberately put in place. What I, Richards, meant by the difficulty of making out the plain sense of poetry um, or Victor Shlovsky's term defamiliarization which is also essentially an acknowledgement of the incredible art and effort required to overturn your pre-existing um, opinions when working through a text. As an art of disambiguation, literary criticism is especially valuable in periods of enforced ideological judgment and conformity. While literary departments and literary uh, and critical publications are everywhere being defunded and undermined, I think literary criticism is gaining popularity as a mode of storytelling. Many contemporary writers import this art form into their works of fiction or prose. They build plot around the interpretive reading of other writers. Um, authors who embrace this literary critical sensibility seem to recognize the good of interpretive openness, of leaving people to draw their own conclusions, and at the same time to feel that this might not be true. This interpretive, this interpretive literature, as I call it, uh, which sometimes it aligns with autofiction, wants to explain the psychodrama of our current catastrophes or help us figure out the range at which harm for another person comes into view. It speaks with the aphoristic authority of someone who's done the processing for you. Um, Jeff, Jeffrey Hartman once called literary criticism institutionalized irony. Um, no less dramatic than the object of its study, literary criticism has a knack for building narrative suspense into the predicament of being left with no logical way to register a, a complaint or name the grievance, even if given the chance. Um, 
skipping forward a little bit, postcolonial studies informed by deconstruction um, are also particularly interested in the subject position that is constitutively and not just circumstantially mute. When asked in a radio interview to explain the title of her famous 1955 essay, Can the Subaltern Speak? Gayatri Spivak quip, quipped, if the subaltern can speak then, thank God, the subaltern is not a subaltern anymore. Writing well outside of post-colonial deconstruction, the literary critic and philosopher Stanley Cavell in his essay, The Avoidance of Love, saw a similar problem or similar dilemma for Cordelia at the start of King Lear. Lear, looking to step down from the throne and divide his kingdom among his three daughters, asks, e asks them each to publicly profess her love for him. For the two oldest daughters, Cavell writes, the task is simple enough. They need only pretend to love, but they do not love. But Cordelia isn't simply being asked to falsify herself. Uh, Cavell explains that it is actually worse than this. For Cordelia, for Cordelia, sorry, to pretend to love we, where you really do love is not obviously possible. There's a crucial, if finely drawn difference between being forced to say what you do not believe and being left with no logical way to say what you do believe. The subtlety of this difference lets the literary critic know um, that they must now intervene because no one else will. And I'll stop there. Um, the rest of the essay connects this uh, in many ways to Chinese, a Chinese diasporic sensibility, um, to Chinese history, to, um, um, to Chinese moral philosophy, right, and, and comes back to explain um, Lee's fictional works and her some of the some of the um, projects that she's undertaking within them, I think difficult philosophical projects. Um, so I'm very lucky to be able to speak with Jane and Elaine. Um, I think they're both thinking uh, through the meaning of being Chinese diaspora for their own, um, you know, feelings and theories about literary critical method, the profession, um, metaphysics of our current world, truth telling, personal relationships, and I'll let them speak about that in just a second. I, you know, I'll say um, here that there are. Um, there's something kind of immodest about, about the title of, of the talk and, and perhaps the essay itself. I mean, I don't mean to speak kind of ex cathedra about the Chinese diaspora. You know, there are many types and circuits of Chinese diaspora. There are sort of, you know, people who uh, live in Taiwan, Japan, Hong Kong, um, you know, Southeast Asia. Uh, there are all the cessationist movements within China there's the Chinese diaspora in Indonesia, which Madeline Bien, uh, to which she belongs and writes about with sort of extraordinary pathos and like simple recipes. There's early Chinese American communities. There are Fujianese and Dongbei um, migrants who perform menial labor in Chinatowns around the world. There are non-native, non-ethnic Chinese who have lived in China and who have left or were expelled. They're like hegemonic, cash-rich Chinese and global metropolitan areas. Um, there and there, of course, are also like far outnumbering any number that I could, you know, put together. So members of the Chinese diaspora who would find, uh, I think, the particular statements that I make about China in the essay anathema. So, I think this is not a disclaimer, but an act of. Um, of disinterpolation, I, I don't wish to hail a community um, because it would be sort of too preclusive and too inclusive at the same time. Um, and in, if you think that the essay has convincingly described a perspectival advantage, um, I also don't really wish to I, attach it to any identity group. I think in some ways the group that I'm really naming right in the essay is Chinese 
dissidents, right? Um, or, you know, writers of conscience um, who belong to the Chinese dissident, um, who are Chinese dissidents or identify as Chinese dissidents. I think that's the real group that I'm describing and addressing. I think the problem with that, with calling it that, is that, you know, and this is part of the argument of the essay, is that you may be a Chinese dissident um, and not even know it, right? Especially if you're a second or third generation or if you're still an immigrant, but you're still in the fray of it, you're still grappling with strange behaviors, um, uh, you know, uh, that your parents may have or that your community members may have who for real or for melodrama uh, are still like enacting scenes of persecution and overcoming, right? Maybe this is um, maybe truer for children and immigrant families who are experiencing the, the kind of symptom, right? Of, of, of something that is longer and older and they might not even have access to that information. Or, you know, they're still dealing with interpersonal relationships that seem tyrannical and that are tyrannical in ways that seem somehow uh, reminiscent, right, of the tyranny of the state. So the invite that's built into the category is kind of a soft one, like, you know, join this sad club if you want to. Um, the, so I've invited Jane and Elaine to join the sad club if they want to. I, I'm, I think that that they're, they're going to have, you know, um, extraordinarily insightful things to say that go beyond this essay. I know that Lang's working on um, um, something like critical mandate, right? Like what, what criteria do we apply to um, uh, the act of accreting details into a kind of statement or a generalized statement about what happens either inside a novel or in a, in a literary history. Um, she has uh, an essay in NLH that also um, really brilliantly tackles um, questions around method, um, which may be kind of too insider baseball for this audience, but nonetheless, if you're interested, um, you know, she has sort of really, really insightful things to say there. Um, and maybe I can start with Lane, if you're willing to, if you want to chime in at this point, um, it's awkward because I'm, I'm invited to respond to my essay. So you're welcome to do that or, or not. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for um, including me in this um, incredible event. And I feel like when I was a girl in Southern, growing up in Irvine, I would never imagine that one day I would be part of a little conversation like this. Um, so that's part of my diasporic experience. Um, there's a lot, there's so many points of this essay that resonate with me or give me a language to think about things like my own experience, my own like very complicated relationship to literary criticism, um, things that are going on in the field and in my own polarized department right now um and i think one of the most important things that i see you doing in the essay like the, one of the central claims is that you are calling attention to how it can be an ethical act like a ethical act of for a critic to be judicious and to make space for judiciousness which is actually quite hard, um, especially when you think about how criticism now just has this dual function. So it has the function of the intellectual work that we're doing, and it also has the function of earning or um, trying to secure institutional resources. And so there's a way in which when when we're thinking about what will secure institutional resources, we can't be as judicious as we might be. And here, one example is like letters of recommendation. If you are abs the, the instructor who is completely judicious and accurate and precise 
and maybe wants to be uh, more modest, <laughs> um, to be honest, is actually, is that an unethical act? Because there is this kind of rhetorical arms race of hyperbole where you have to be very grandiose and say, this is an amazing, you know, this project's going to change the world and this is the most brilliant person ever. And so I think there, it really, there's an, this tension between wanting to be committed to judiciousness as an intellectual ethos and this scarcity that everyone is facing, this scarcity of time. So we have to take all these shortcuts to decide, oh, what, what can we afford to not read or to not cite or not engage with at the same time that because people are trying to get attention, they taking a more extreme position, making a larger totalizing claim is more effective um, at getting those resources um, so that it can be actually rational to um, not uh, adhere to like a really strict standard of judiciousness. Um, so I think that making space for um, how this could be an, a, a, a counter move that we try to um, work toward is something that I, I really um, appreciate about the essay. Um, you know, the setting, setting parameters or, or trying to decide the social context of judiciousness is something that I thought about a lot with this essay because part of, you know, part of the problem of, like there's, there's this kind of theme in the essay that's kind of really confused about like cancel culture. Right? Genuinely, like I'm genuinely in the dark about it because um, on the one hand, you know, I think that, I mean, it's, I'm not saying anything that's particularly original, but I think that there is this kind of, um, okay, let me put this, I, I mean, I think we, if we should disambiguate, right? That's sort of the, that's the point of this, let's disambiguate. So we might describe sort of bad cancel culture as a kind of vulnerability within the normative practices of securing poetic justice, which is like, you know, justice being served exactly as it should. Right? But there's a kind of special vulnerability uh, nowadays is sort of um, combining with uh, various platforms that algorithmically reward, you know, bad faith, bad faith and algorithmically reward, kind of, you know, sliding scale, lowest common denominatorism. Um, it, the, the vulnerability that's created is that you have a situation that would allow the sort of the shameless and the ruthless and the disproportionately self-victimizing to persecute who are those who are actually relatively blame, blameless, right, and inclined to silence on principle. Um, that's why kind of adjudicating, you know, the the social situation, right, and the cost-benefit analysis. Um, and, and I know you have um, a kind of you, you have thought about what it means for certain acts of judgment to be, you know, no cost or low cost, right? And that, that being a kind of good, right? Because you're sort of practicing on literary criticism or as through literary criticism on text. Um, whereas in other fora, right? Uh, the same judgments or the same forcefulness of, of, of judging has real cost in there or become subject to something like the economy. Right, and, and I think and that the, this connects to another part of your piece, um, which is about like staying the hand, like when is it, when does it become inhumane or cruel to call someone out further or to name something that is going on? And um, uh, I was, uh, looking at uh, Kathy Park Hong's minor feelings, which Jane has written about as well. Um, and she talks about how the 
the Asian immigrant is the perfect neoliberal <laughs> subject because of their desire to survive, like do anything to survive at any cost. And there's something like that's a really uh, fascinating insight. And I think it's really apt at the same time. It's a little bit cruel. Like, would we ever want to inform someone who's been working their whole life to survive at any cost that, oh, hey, by the way, you're the perfect neoliberal subject. And I, ha I deal with this in my own institution because we're a public institution and we have like a really wide range of students who come and currently I have a Muslim st woman student who's working 16 hour night shifts at the hospital and she comes to my Britlet survey without having slept and she's the one most enthusiastic person about Keats or um, Jane Austen or Wordsworth, whereas my other students want to cancel all of them. Um, and I think I, I want to make space for her and not essentialize the reasoning, like why does she like it, um, and be open to thinking about what is her point of entry into these texts and not immediately translate this into some kind of political signal or meaning that she's not aware of and just give her the benefit of the doubt that she understands what is a harm <laughs> to her and if she wants to if she doesn't if she wants to find solace <laughs> in Keats um as uh, Anahi Nersessian does in her new Keats book um then I want to create a space where she can do that. And there's this kind of mid-level of attachment that I think Nan's piece is asking us to make space for. Um, so just to give just another little example, um, Grace Wong, who's at UC Davis, has written about how the Asian American relationship to classical music. And something, and this is, you could very obviously quickly say, oh, this is, a Eurocentrism and Western cultural hegemony, but then she finds that within that, it it counterintuitively what ha, what has drawn a lot of Asian American immigrants to classical music is it reminds them of listening to classical music at home in Taiwan or in China, and so that is one something that is actually feels familiar to them, and so when you don't have many points of contact where you can feel something that's familiar then this is a this is a something positive and that is local and you could say oh well this is because western hegemony has taken over asia but at the same time there's we have all these scales of existence and all these levels of attachment um and we are always living in all of these, negotiating all these different levels at the same time. And so I think we want to make space for those nuances and that disambiguation. Yeah, and there's, you know, there's a running thread, but you know, in this essay and, and in my own work and in conversations with Jane about resource conservation, right? just that um, you know, there's, the essay argues something like, look like for some people, you know, uh, melodrama is their only recourse. That's all they have, you know? And so it does become cruel to disambiguate, um, or rather it becomes tragic, right? It becomes tragic in the sense that, you know, there can be a, um, a, a keener awareness of the, it just means thinking about consequences implicit in action, right? And um, thinking about the fact that a loss, that the absence of justice over time, um, you know, which I think really does apply in this case, that, that the absence of just, justice over time is the kind of loss of identity. And so you have the situation of um, existential of the kind of existential gaslight, and then people who then also happen to be like immigrants or poor or, or whatever, like diasporic, um, have very very few resources. Like lit literary literature is one of them. Like it's almost free. Right? Um, I remember picking up those copies of um, like uh, like Cast Off, like Lawrence Perrine story and structure, and 
you know, 50 best American short stories and then all the like the goofy commentary, you know, that goes with each one of them. Um, because, because like oddly enough, because there's something kind of socialist, right, in my upbringing, um, I spent a great deal of time in China when it was the, during what was, um, what is called Gaigo Kaifang, right, the, the opening and the reform. And, but many parts of that world were still quite socialist, right, and the ration, there's sort of still kind of this remin, um, uh, 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 different forms of rationing that were still happening, like people struggling with the hukou system, um, you know, getting like ten dollars a month, right? Ten, sorry, ten yuan a month. So, in that kind of upbringing, which I, you know, am nostalgic for in in, in some ways, I think that there's um, a an unwillingness to like waste stuff, you know. And I think that interpretive. Um, Openness is a wonderful, like it's been celebrated. Uh, you know, we're, we're supposed to advocate for this all the time, and I, and I certainly do. Um, but there's something about interpretive openness that seems like it is a, um, you know, that, that seems like a kind of luxury, right? It's something that you have when, um, you know, when, when things are still more or less stable. I feel like interpretive, like an interpretive free-for-all is a first world luxury. And that, you know, we can't afford to be sort of wasteful, right, even in, even in interpretation. Um, so, this, so the sensibility is sort of aware, all right, it, 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 it's sort of aware that this might be essentialism, like, is this Chinese? Is, you know, is this, this is not Chinese? Um, it's aware that interpretive, insistence on interpretive accuracy and like, you know, getting it right sometimes looks like the closing of all interpretive channels except the official party line, but this all, the sensibility is also sort of more insistent that maybe we try to get it a little more right. So there's, there's that kind of um, uh, aversion to waste that's related to how we can conceptualize different forms of expressions of trauma in melodrama, for example. And I know that Jane, she's thought about this a lot and, and about, um, you know, Asian contemporary glo uh, global Anglophone or Asian diasporic or even Sinophone, um, Asian imperial forms. Uh, these cultures and subcultures that recycle genres from empire um, that are grappling with self-expression through um, stereotype, right? Which is a, a way of short-circuiting causality. <laughs> um, you know, that there's, a, uh, that there's a underlying argument in the paper that, you know, that, that melodrama, what it does is it, it sort of connects cause and effect faster, right? So, that's why for people who have nothing, it's it's like a kind of a go-to because it, you can immediately um, sort of make your case, right? Um, so, short, you know, recycling melodrama. So I guess I'll let I'll let Jane say uh, her piece now um, and respond if you want to, Jane. Yeah, thanks so, so much. Um, I yeah, I want to echo um, Elaine, which is. Um, you know, I'm like a, a stereotypical lapsed um, pre-med undergrad student, so I would have never fathomed also this this context um, and and kind of the the belatedness of that of that realization, the belatedness of finding someone like you, um, and and also the belated realization that um, the type of literary critical attunement um, or sensibility that you have might actually have a larger history, a large collective history that's founded on um, distance and loss and trauma. Like all of that um, kind of only happens after the fact. And, and it was my primary experience um, in reading Nan, Nan's amazing piece, um, which was recognition that was precisely about um, 
finding sustenance in objects that um, aren't about you or objects that aren't speaking to you or objects that aren't, aren't made for you. Um, and, and I was really um, happy now that you brought up the, the form of the essay because that's kind of what I, you know, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about that and I could like spend the rest of this session close reading the form of your essay. Um, but, you know, I reread it a, quite a few times by now and I'm still um, taken aback by the, the pleasures of discernment of the micro genres that are at play in your essay. Um, and then also, you know, finally, um, it's sort of like dawning on me that the opening gambit um, of opening with Yun Lee talking about more um, to process her own childhood trauma um, it, in something like memoir, but is also kind of semi-fictionalized, is, is a, the necessary um, opening for a piece about Chinese diaspora and um, disambiguation um, between micro genres. So like, you know, the way that I sort of come to my research and the way that I think um, my particular conjunction as like a lonely, sad Chinese diasporic, like I was born in, in, in mainland China um, in, in 89, a sort of few months before the Tiananmen Square incident and um, immigrated to Canada um, shortly, a few years after that. Um, and, and sort of, you know, I have very, a uh, very um, loose grasp of, of history, including including my own, um, and and so the things that uh, were I really connected to um, growing up were, um, you know, Elaine. This might I don't know. I don't want to assume were sort of um, imperial genres, and in, in particular Victorian novels. So your student um, that you were talking about again, I don't want to presume it, and that's kind of the um, the sort of mid-level attachment made available that you were sort of talking about, Elaine, in Nan's essay. I think that's that's sort of what, um, I don't even know if it's cathexis, like that's sort of what I think is, is sort of happening. Um, so even Lee writes about Elizabeth Bowen. Elizabeth Bowen was, you know, my undergrad thesis, you know, like, so there's these things where it's like, um, I'm, I'm kind of doing um, like a homeland hive mind galaxy brain um, system in my brain, but, but it kind of, you know, the, the, the ways in which we find each other and we find types of stories that, that aren't necessarily um, meant for us and find them much af like long after the fact. To, so um, the way in which uh, I was rereading parts of Rage Howe's writing diaspora this morning and she um, opens by talking, by making the connection, not just between um, Edward Said's sort of Victorian, um, 19th century South Asian Orientalism and, and how that might drift to um, contemporary East Asian um, forms of Orientalism and, you know, China is sort of her main ex exemplar. Um, so that's sort of what my project is, is tracking too, is sort of thinking about, you know, what happens when uh, Victorian genres continue to get taken up and, and what happens when Orientalist stereotypes and Orientalist forms get taken up by, by Orientals themselves. Like what happens in that displacement um, and, and what do it, and because there are sort of stereotypes that both get codified and rigidified, but also loosened in um, that kind of long durée transfer, what does it require for the contemporary reader, um, you know, and for as, as an example, the contemporary Chinese reader, but not necessarily, right? What does it mean for us to be able to disambiguate across um, all of those layers um, of remediation? So, yeah, I mean, again, this is kind of maybe back to um, what Nan says about um, proportionality and, and where one stops. Um, critique, but also, uh, you know, at what level in, in, do we um, track? Yeah, um, that kind of that kind of analysis. So, um, one of the ways in which, you know, I think for me, uh, close reading and literary criticism always felt very much like um, a limited resource that um, allowed me to sort of understand. Um, my place in, in a world where I, I've had very little sense 
of genealogy. Um, you know, so like that, that is kind of the sustenance, but then sort of the flip side is seeing close reading and seeing your, your objects get weaponized um, in back to the sort of the cancel um, culture where close reading gets disproportionately um, overused. And, and so maybe I will sort of stop there, but I, you know, that's sort of where I'm trying to sort of figure out what is happening to micro genres of stereotypes and what's happening, um, how are stereotypes um, someone's last resort and, if, and how are stereotypes someone's only resource of self-representation or self-acknowledgement. Um, so in stereotypes, sort of what are the affordances, right? And, and one of them sort of Nan, Nan points out in her essay is, is about kind of legibility. It's, it's, you know, we cathect to bad genres. Um, A, because they're all we know um, sometimes, and, and B, because that's the only way that anyone will pay attention to you. So, you know, that's sort of, you know, a lot, a lot of problems that are happening in sort of global Asian and Asian Anglophone popular culture is about pushing um, the stereotype to a, a certain limit without, um, you know, claiming it as kind of def definitively explanatory. Um, yeah, Matt, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Yeah, no, I, you know, it's, it's moving to me here you see that. It, there, the, the subjectivity that I'm trying to describe in the essay is someone, you know, who can't rely on official history and can't rely on personal history and can't rely on oral narratives, like even within the family, um, and can't really rely on media, right? Like these poor subs um, will, might, right, might find in good literary criticism a kind of sanity check. <laughs> you know, like if I can, using just my brain, because that's all I have, uh, if I can work out causality without landing on any particular kind of logical fallacy or prejudice, like, and if someone else can, can do that as well, not exactly as I have, but, you know, along the same lines, um, I, I feel like then I have a stable object. We, we need good objects and good ways of moving through them just like not you know not not as like a decorative thing but as a matter of survival um just to be a little bit melodramatic so that's why to get back to our theme of of being late on the scene of like it taking you know when when someone's subject to this kind of gaslighting it takes a really long time and lots and lots of well-made objects right stable well-made objects uh to to figure out you know to not be in the dark or to to come out of the dark um a little and that's why you know whether it's like liberal bourgeois subjectivity which frankly like mattered a lot to me as a child of trying to like self-differentiate and have any like any privacy right whether it's liberal bourgeois subjectivity or nowadays I don't know, like entire literature departments or entire English departments that are being um, um, canceled or, or, you know, whatever. I, I, I do understand it. I mean, that the essay is about trying to understand the sequences that lead to someone wishing the cat, like the, the final cancellation of something. <laughs> like no more, you know, no more nuancing, um, uh, no more ambiguity, you know, like I wish to cancel Maoism once and for all. Um, and I, so what I'm trying to say is like, I do understand why there might be a series of steps that leads to something that dire, right? Even from those speaking from within the profession of the discipline. On the other hand, you know, there is something to it that's reminiscent of like, you know, children who, um, right, like who don't want to share their toys, you know, and would rather break them, right, than let you have a turn. So, 
I'm again, I, you know, I, I don't really know where to land on that. I, I feel the situation like, to be an institution of tragedy, maybe productively, maybe not. Um, but this, this, this business of like needing, you know, of needing good representations of causality and good uh, safe spaces to practice moving through causality uh, is something that I think about. I mean, I'm finding resources. I'm finding resources for that within literary criticism, but also within, like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to learn more about Chinese moral philosophy and um, the ways that, for example, you know, that like, um, that Mencius Monzi um, has this in his synthetic account of Taoism and Confucianism, he has this sort of like affective disposition to compassion, right? Or um, to yin, right? In the face of another's distress, which he says is not programmable, right? that it cannot be uh, instructed down to the very last step. And so because it can't be programmable, that sets some limits on the efficacy of external social controls for this impulse, right? whether to activate it or suppress it. And so it must be this kind of, this kind of compassion, right, um, has to be cultivated, which means that it need, requires practice, right? It requires kind of scenarios of limited consequentiality, simulations that allow you to kind of figure out, you know, like real from fake, right from wrong, um, or how one thing leads to another. Uh, so, yeah, I'll, I'll start talking, see if some of them Can I, I have a, I just want to pick up on um, something that you had said earlier, Nan, about truth telling and also tie it to Jane's, <laughs> Jane's relationship to Victorian uh, fiction. And I think also because I haven't shared my weird um, path to, um, uh, from China. So I think uh, I, my experience has been minor, like having been minoritized in all of these outwardly invisible ways. So my grandparents were peasants or in working class um, Shanghainese uh, refugees who, who fled to Hong Kong after World War II. To, so they were not intellectuals. And so this is a case of, again, those local uh, proximate attachment. They went toward the British colony um, because of this need to survive. Um, and then my parents were both kind of translating for their parents because they, the parents were not literate or barely literate, speaking Shanghainese, not Cantonese. Um, and then my parents grew up in tenement housing in Hong Kong. And my dad, by chance, a neighbor told him uh, that you could take an entrance exam for a Stuyvesant type of high school. And he got into that. And that turned out to be a feeder to MIT, where he got a lot of aid and was a janitor and cafeteria worker. So that's how I was born in LA. But I did not grow up in San Gabriel Valley where there are a lot of people from Hong Kong who speak Cantonese. I grew up in Irvine where at that time there was a very large Taiwanese and Korean American population. So I went to a Chinese school that was run by Taiwanese people and they were speaking Mandarin. So the first two years I had no idea <laughs> what was going on because I spoke Cantonese and all of the children who were, who bullied me um, growing up, they were Asian. So I don't even have, <laughs> I don't even have the narrative that a lot of people have where it's like, oh, I was the only Asian kid in, and this is not saying that that's a privilege, but it just, there's, there's so many unique idiosyncratic narratives. Um, and so for me, it has always felt like none of the scripts really fit. And I'm always walking on along the borders in between all these different groups. And so definitely, um, as both of you have said, literature was a place, <laughs> like one of the very few places where I could feel at home. 
Um, and Deidre Lynch also says this, like it's a literature has a steadying, can have a steadying function. Bell Hooks says beauty and pleasure and aesthetic experience has value for those who aren't at home in the world. But then what happened to me when I got further into literary study was that, oh, post-structuralism says liter like the way that language works on me is not how, it <laughs> how I think or um, what seems really central to me about literary experience, that's naive and banal and not worth talking about in a critical way. Um, and there's like, your liberal subject was formed in this way. And I was like, I feel like there's a lot of other influences <laughs> that <laughs> affected, <laughs> affected my subject formation. So, so I tried to, this is why I, I actually was searching for a, voc a conceptual vocabulary for validating experiences that felt real and true to me and a long history of readers. And this actually led me to psychology and a lot of this work has been done in education schools because that's where they really need to know how people make sense of a text or what they're like getting out of a text. And then I came back with, you know, these accounts of what happens when we read and then then you get dismissed for being scientistic or, oh, this is just common sense anywhere. This is really obvious. Um, but I think it's important, the truth telling element to this, this like cross disciplinary method that I've been trying to work on is that um, a lot of our assumpt our literary critical assumptions now are uh, include assumptions about um, psychological and social phenomena. So what like what is influencing what what causes what, and whether these assumptions are true or not really matters if we're committed to these claims that we make about the effect that a text can have on actual people in the world or actual events. Jane, did you want to jump in with anything? I'm happy to. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, I maybe sort of a little bit off of what um, Elaine was just saying. Um, you know, there is this sense of like um, over identification. Um, you know, I, I know there's a lot of there's been a lot of debate on Twitter. About, post critique lately, and I'm mostly trying to stay out of the fray, but um, I do think that questions of um, attachment for um, a reader who uh, barely knows, like, like I, I think, it, like I feel, I, you know, feel like I, I'm a very, you know, intuitive um, reader, and it's probably because, um, you know, I'm kind of like Nan's um, if I am a Chinese dissident, I would never know it. Like I wouldn't have the the language or or the critical concepts um, to know such a thing. And so, you know, one thing that you were saying, Elaine, that I do resonate with is the kind of um, attempt to take away even um, an investment in subjectivity. <laughs> um, and and that's something that's like that I'm sort of working through with Asian American um, texts, um, a, a lot of Asian American avant-garde texts and, and modernist texts, and, and, and a lot of sort of um, a kind of attempt to show Asian American subjectivity and Asian American aesthetic value um, through aesthetic difficulty, um, and, and, and whether you can kind of disambiguate um, through these texts. Right? So that's one question. Um, but you know, one of the reasons why I affected to Victorian realism is because I, I, I wanted subjectivity, right? And I wanted subjectivity probably in like a very naive way. Um, but I also wanted, like, I didn't want modernism, like the world was already sort of uh, confusing enough. So I think like all the things that you guys are kind of saying around causality, like I have a secret theory that like, all my um, Chinese diaspora friends are like, secretly system theory people, like I just love I love um, networks that have boundaries and that makes sense. Um, and I, I agree, like, there's a kind of wonky um, alignment sometimes with the work that we do um, that, that, that might feel disciplinarily off or something like that. But yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one, one of the things that um, 
I, I continued to sort of confront again and, and again, especially as the field, English literary studies kind of moves at pace with all sorts of theory wars um, and hermeneutical shifts. And this might be just sort of part of the sad story of being belated Asians is, you know, I'm still trying to figure out how do we understand, yeah, moral disambiguation and, and you know, I, I understand, you know, I, I'm very invested in sort of Marxist aesthetics. I'm, I'm, I understand that the, the desire for um, radical collectivity and, you know, people write about the utopian potential of the mass. Um, but there is this sort of lingering desire where like, I don't, I want to figure out, you know, as neoliberal or as liberal as it is, I want to figure out what, what the subject is. Like, I'm still kind of stuck um, somewhere in the past. So um, there's this sense, I think, that I feel like what I'm trying to do, and it's part of what I see Nan is trying to do in her essay, is a kind of Asian um, or Chinese reparative reading. And I really mean it in the way of, of, of repair and, and also going back in time. Going back in time um, and lingering on the toys of liter the best toys of literary criticism and, and objects that people haven't taken away yet, haven't sort of denounced, haven't said is like passe um, or ideologically suspect, right? Like I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm sort of decades behind in my sensibilities of where the field is moving. And, and it's a really strange, it's a really strange thing to be caught in um, uh, at, at the current, yeah, especially in, in, in the current moment of as we're saying, Elaine, at the beginning, um, a lot of limited resources um, for those for, for 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 grad students. Um, and I'll just quickly say that you know that that even um, as you're working on the remedial, <laughs> that those are still behind. Like we like you know we just got here. Um, there's also something in your work, and this is like just a kind of ad, right? Like you know, people um, keep in lookout for Jane's work because you're, the way that you're thinking about um, comparative, reparative work and paranoid work actually takes us to a place that allows us to see co new comments of global um, uh, metaphysics where like you can actually have, you know, uh, the worst kinds of Asian <laughs> imperial forms, right? or or, uh, or uh, forms of tyranny, Asian gaslight, like combined with cap with hypercapitalism, right? Or with you know through spectral, like there's might there, there might be something worse, right? Than than capitalism and 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 Maoist communism, like separately even, right? Or or you know neo Asian neo imperialism in, in U.S. neo imperialism yeah. separately. Uh, so I think that's that's really exciting and 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 depressing and but something to look for. <laughs> so I, I'll um, let Rachel or Lisa. Oh, okay, hi. Um, uh, give us questions from the Q and A. Yeah, uh, we're gonna transition. Um, this has been so exciting and 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 rich that we've gone over by a little bit, but we're still definitely going to make time for Q&A. Um, just kind of building off of what Jane had started to say, there's a, um, a anonymous question from the audience um, about how do you find good objects? So the, um, the audience member says, First of all, thank you for the extremely compelling and sustaining conversation. I'm curious about how one goes about discerning good objects. I recognize that there's probably no recipe for that, but I'd like to get a sense of how you all know or plausibly suspect that you've got a good object with good causality if such a sense is possible. And such a difficult question. Um, and I, and I don't want to say like, it's like porn, like you'll, you'll know it when you see it, especially if you're, <laughs> you guys, for you, you've just been trained. Um, uh, but th there's a little, there's a little bit of that and I, and it's a little aff affective, but maybe you guys have, um, like I think more empirical answer. One, one phrase that really stood out to me in Nan's piece was, compassionate understanding. And I think that kind of 
is something that is also relates to what we were just talking about about the polarization and can't like just like extreme crowding out of nuance that is going on with these method wars and and so there was just recently um a piece in the chronicle of higher education about how um because radical positions get institutional rewards that like this includes repudiating your own field and and because i'm also a systems thinker like jane i've been reading a lot of um work on like political po polarization and these kind of systems theory explanations and there's a, a psychologist and law professor at yale who talks about climate change like resistance to information about climate change and how it's it's rational to reject information when it's costly to yourself to do so and the issue is that even the it, it, it even if even if it weakens the group as a whole it makes sense to do take a position that will allow you to have a relative we hire status so we can see this in like the senate it's like even though it's bad for the country as a whole it's better for me like there's a cost to me to do this and i even even when i think about this i can compassionately understand what might drive someone to feel like oh i can't afford to think about another person because i can't afford to lose ground with my social group and to like see another point of view but i think maybe that is that is my my only i mean that just is also like an obsessive <laughs> sensibility that i have is like oh well what are like what is the most charitable <laughs> way of thinking about this person's position and i think that is how maybe this a starting point for assessing whether you are like in good faith or not or like handling something in good in the best way that you because you can only do it the best way that you can but also having the humility to be like oh am i reacting to this because i feel threatened and i want to like grab like i want to take power like am i am i empowering am i seeking to empower others or am i has it turned into a desire to take power for myself and yeah, there's a i mean that that actually is the fastest way to answer like how do you know what a good object is i i you know I, one of the ways that i'm proposing in this essay is like you know it if it makes you feel disambiguation to be tragic so think about your kind of, um, you know, your uh, Solomon's judgment, right? Which distinguishes between two almost identical things um, by virtue of how willing each is to harm the thing which they professedly love. Okay, so that's one criteria. There's actually a, 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 a Western Han Dynasty version of the same uh, situation um, that gets remade into a Yuan Dynasty Zaju called um, Hui Lanji, which is uh, uh, the, the, the chalk circle, right? So, th so these are, I mean, they're sort of, you know, multicultural versions of this. Um, another quick example that I can think of is I just taught um, Hawthorne's uh, The Wives of the Dead this morning, <laughs> which is about the kinds of necessary estrangement and mistrust that needs to happen for two otherwise identical characters. And this gets back to our conversation about subjectivity. Um, you know, two widows who both, who are sisters, you know, who both lose their husbands, we think, and who both find out that their husbands are not actually dead. <laughs> um, you know, you get into this sort of dark tale about disposability, like, why do you need one when you already have the other, right? And the stories about how people who are otherwise interchangeable, which is like, you know, in, in Jane's work, and, and many others, you know, it's a, it's a kind of an Asian problem. <laughs> like you can't tell, you can't tell us apart. Um, that the disposability ha still has ways to signal to you that a change can be made in Hawthorne's story, though, you know, the trade-off is that there has to be some estrangement that happens, right? There's a cost to, to disambiguation of differentiate of self-differentiation. And um, so that's one way to know it's like you have a good object when 
uh, it encourages you to sort of disambiguate beyond a point that will um, still scan as okayness. Um, there are a lot of questions. I don't think we're going to get to all of them, but that's very exciting. Um, let's see. A another anonymous uh, attendee asked, um, I would love to hear from the speakers if they wish to share, how does an ethos of proportionality, if you want to call it that, inform the their literary criticism and close readings? Does proportionality risk an infinite regress of self-correction? Does arriving at a more proportional analysis require modulating tone, style, lens, according to object and audience within the same essay, something more? I would, I, I mean, the thing that I keep going, I don't know if I'll be able to find it um, very quickly, but um, one of the, the turns that happens, because Nan, you return to, there's a kind of like, um, not only kind of a logical proof like structure to your essay, but there's a sense of like how much lit crit, how much meta lit crit, how much um, meditation on political stakes. Um, but there are, sorry, I shouldn't have answered first because I need to need to find it. But you talk about how um, judiciousness and moral disambiguation happens at the site of, of literary criticism, if not in the text, um, if not in the object or story itself, um, then in the, the felicitous speech act that is um, disambiguating in the literary criticism. And then that, that it might be enough to point it out and then, and then let it lie. Like, I think that's sort of one of the, the again, kind of thinking about mid-level okayness <laughs> or attachment um, that one of the um, wonderful things about literary criticism is, is that it's a simulation, is that it doesn't need to redound on the world um, with, um, you know, an infinite regressiveness of, of stakes. So kind of finding a stopping point um, in pointing something out, um, the enoughness there, um, was something that I, you know, again, really spoke to me in your essay. Yeah, no, that, that's actually a brilliant, brilliant question. There's a formulation in it that's brilliant too um, about how proportionality actually becomes a form of self censorship. Uh, and 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 we have talked about this separately, uh, me and Elaine and and and, and Jane and I, um, how those who are most responsive to judiciousness, right, uh, whether. Whether you think of it as like the flexible Asian kid, right, who wants to, who really is trying to please everyone, um, just to risk a stereotype, or whether, you know, you have subjects who are just because of the types of subjects they are, are particularly sensitive to that kind of um, self qualification, they're going to endlessly self qualify while those who need to here and the most will continue to do with whatever it is that they do so yeah there's definitely like moral hazard here i don't really have a good solution to that i have a couple i have a couple of additional points to chime in um so for my own writing i've noticed that while i love I love other people's criticism that is like use really good at using metaphors. So I love like Elaine Scarry's writing and she's just like a genius at using metaphors, but I cannot let myself use metaphors in my own criticism because I like rarely, because I'm always just like, well, this isn't, this like obscures <laughs> what I'm really trying to say. And so I have this very plain style to the point where sometimes people will say like, oh, this is a very modest argument. And which of course then I'm just like, oh, am I writing in an Asian, <laughs> like a modest Asian way? But I think it is because I would rather say less than over claim. And then the second part of this, which relates to what we were all speaking about earlier is the about the causality, like claims about causality. Something that's really important to me in this truth telling component is that often because of the nature of close reading, we move from like a tiny detail to a giant 
effect, right? But then if we are serious about how cause and effect works, often sometimes the largest effect is something really simple or not interesting or obvious. And then, but that's not interesting. So then we have to say this tiny detail, but often if we really think about who's paying attention to this detail, maybe that's not even perceptible to most readers, so it doesn't have the effect that we think it does. So in fact, claiming that that has a huge effect is actually counterproductive to your political cause because we're looking at the wrong area. And there's a lot of social psychological research about like this huge disconnect even between beliefs and behavior. So even if you know very firmly something is true, you might not act on it. Um, but that's all I, that's all I say. Maybe we'll do two more questions if that sounds good and then wrap up. Um, so uh, Amy Wong has asked, I'm wondering what purchase or not does Western psychoanalysis have on the process of disambiguation? I personally equivocate on um, its efficacy. And I'm also wondering about, Nan, your choice to use the term gaslighting, but not to pursue the psychoanalytic further. I'd love to hear you talk about it. Oh, man. I'm not really equipped to talk about that. Um, you know, I think that there, all I'll say is that there, uh, that, that the psychoanalytic lens allow us to scale at least up and down between psycholibidinal investments in, um, uh, you know, narratives of, um, we could call them sort of hypochondriacal, um, hypochondriacal uh, narratives about, about self-victimizing or about victimization and persecution that there are, you know, repetition, that there's repetition compulsion right, built into this trauma that um, is reflective of the cycle of the null investments of the state, right? Of the, I'm now, now talking about a tyrannical state or a totalitarian state or something to which you cathect um, because you uh, have a relationship to it that's erotic, right? That has to do with um, your investments in your self in your in your um, ability to be acknowledged <laughs> in in certain ways right in um through, in code or otherwise so i think that's all i'm qualified to say i'm curious to see uh what jane and elaine uh, want to add yeah there's actually i think a move now there's a number of people working on object relations theory and, and attachment um uh the psychoanalytic kind of attachment not the rita felsky attachment which she she disambiguates her use of attachment from attachment theory and psychoanalysis and i have to just reveal like put myself on the line and reveal that i because i'm my cross-disciplinary connection is with like contemporary psychological research, I actually have bypassed the psychoanalytic those those narratives. Although I see how I see how that style of discourse is is much closer to what literary critics are familiar with and comfortable with and and working with those narratives. But for me, I feel like there is actually so so many useful conceptual tools from just psychology and it's not neurology it's not neuroscience it's just um things about like what happens when we read a text what's going on when we read a text or emotions and all of these things are not it, it's not even part of the replication crisis like a lot of these findings were discovered in the 50s or the 70s and it's very the field of psychology is very continuous with victorian um approaches to like the early beginnings of of psychology so i think that is my i oh so so my my issue is that for example often an object relations theory you will turn the text into a metaphoric uh, uh, transitional object. 
but I want to use psych like psychology that's actually about the text itself, not a metaphoric transitional object. And there's tools that we now have to do that to directly instead of setting up like, oh, the text is like the teddy bear. Like, of course, this is caricature of that, those moves, which can be like really stunning. Um, but that is just my own, my own affinity to something more grounded in um, like empirical findings. Yeah, I just quickly say that um, I, I still think there's still, I'm, I'm still really fixate, I'm stuck on, um, I was talk, talking to Nan about this, I'm stuck on a melancholia still. Um, I'm, I really feel like um, one of the diasporic sensibilities is ongoing melancholia without mourning and, and the repetition therein. Um, feels, tra I mean, it feels tragic to me. And it, it feels like, it feels tragic because it entails a necessary ongoing, the ongoing, necessary ongoing work of disambiguation that does not promise, um, yeah, could be kind of the prior, the prior question, right? This kind of endless regression um, doesn't necessarily pro promise catharsis <laughs> um, or, or resolution, um, but just sort of the ongoing work of moving through objects, moving through texts, um, and moving through a, a sense of, of yourself through, you know, this, this kind of redundant redundancy um, of disambiguation um, that, for me, um, I still sort of really sort of try and, you know, triangulate through, through questions of um, loss without, without sort of end. Um, do we want to do one more? How's everyone feeling? Um, okay, so to, to wrap up, we have another anonymous question. Um, someone says, Thank you for your time and for the amazing article. Um, they loved the piece. When reading it, discernment and disambiguation came across as a very personal act. Are there ways or situations where you imagine it could be done as a group? Or is this question just like asking if the subaltern can speak? Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, like this essay is, um, you know, a political essay. It's a, it 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 wants to um, draw on maybe an older version of virtue, um, maybe in the Aristotelian sense or in the Confucian sense, it's understanding <laughs> as dis all disambiguation, and um, to to ha imagine this, of course, as a or imagine is the wrong word to, to say that it has already happened like that that literary criticism is a kind of collective endeavor of raising disambiguation or at least like figuring out where one how far one should go and, and where one should stop uh you know of course the, it, it, and that it will have this kind of momentum of um uh, of, of forming something like tragedy as a political institution. Yeah, and I, I think like for, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful um, for knowing Nan and, and, and Elaine in real time. Um, but I think, you know, one of the, um, I don't know if tra tragic is the right term, but I definitely think one of the ways in which I would characterize um, my position in, in studying literary um, English, Anglophone, English language literary criticism in, in an American context that nonetheless has to sort of take into account um, the frenzy of global hyperlegible uh, contemporary objects um, is that part of realizing where you are in the present, um, just in the, pre like pragmatically in the present, is always going to involve some kind of um, co collective endeavor of, of, of work that's already been done. Like I, there's a really uncanny sense when, when I'm close reading that I'm doing something really old um, 
for the, the current for for my my contemporary objects that that's that kind of hangover effect is kind of just built in so you know that that's sort of how i would imagine the kind of collaborative endeavor and, and what feels melancholic about it is that um it it, it requires um me to sort of continue to say ray chow who wrote about all of this 30 years ago and it and it and and, and and it's um it's like a cautionary tale it was a cautionary tale then um and it continues to be one now right so again this question of limited resources that requires you to collaborate across strange strange temporalities like my work isn't trendy in, in the way that it, it, it might otherwise be because I'm, I'm really trying to triangulate insights from from strange yeah strange timelines strange scales um um Anyway, so. I don't have anything to add. Go ahead, Rachel. I mean, I think close reading, it, it, it's something that feels haunted, right? No matter how you're doing it. That it's, you know, this is always for me at least the, um, one of like the, the, the conflicts of reading is that it's, it's inherently solitary and at the same time inherently communal. Um, and, and so, as part of that like the process of discernment and then and then discussing the process of discernment and and thinking about how that also like becomes rapidly communal of, of then like comparing those close readings with others and and using that as a kind of reference point in judgment yeah i mean there's for sure a kind of verificationism that has to happen right that, that you know that's how the sanity check works is that at the very you need like at least two people but you also need, of course, the institutions that 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 um, verify, right, or legitimate them, and so forth. So it, it requires sort of layers of good faith. Um, but we, you know, the, one of the things that you see me say, maybe I'll, I'll I'll finish on this point, is that there are many ways to adjudicate what propaganda um, is, right, and you know that by and large in the West they're adjudicated based on. Um, their utterances. So like utter, utterances are tested for their truth value mm -hmm. uh, or they are um, uh, like within logical positivism, like there are ways to kind of perform a kind of empirical verificationism on the <laughs> truthfulness of certain statements or even like their admissibility, right, as truth claims. The, the, you know, for me, like propaganda has to do with the felicity of, of what it silences and what you know, how much air, <laughs> like how much air is being taken up in the room is, is like a good way to think about what propaganda is. And, um, you know, if community, if interpretive communities are, are taken away because the air, like the air has been sucked out, you know, there's just not enough to go around, um, you know, then, then we have a problem because then truly like people become quite isolated, right? They, they have no, no other way of being just like like just you know, doing a sanity check so so um a collective yes by you know by necessity yeah not not aspirationally like just logically yes it has to be uh you know more than more than one or two um well on that note we can celebrate the collective that we had together tonight this was just an astounding conversation which you know is evidenced by tr truly the you know 50 comments saying so in the chat um so thank you non and thank you elaine and thank you jane and thank you everyone who was here tonight listening with us um there were a couple questions in the chat about whether or not um this will be posted online as a video after the fact. Um, we think we're going to do that. Um, if we do, we will send around an email to participants with that link. But if, if that happens, it'll be on the YouTube. I'm sorry, I don't have a definitive answer for you right now. Um, but if it happens, we'll let you know. Um, I will a copy of all the questions. And so I can't promise to like answer them, but, but I will see them, especially if they're more critical ones or ones that are, um, you know, Yeah, we've saved them all, so. I, they will be before my eyes. Um, yeah, and once again, um, if you don't subscribe to N plus one, consider doing it. You will get to read Man and many other people. 
And um, we're, again, just so grateful to have had the three of you here with us tonight. So thank you so much. Happy Lunar New Year.